Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages, teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Have you ever experienced the pain of rejection? Or maybe I should rephrase that question. When and how have you experienced rejection? I recall a time way back in my childhood when two friends of mine decided to put me outside our triangle of friendship. I was out riding my bike when I, I spotted them on their bikes. And I started riding towards them when they saw me coming, they sped away as fast as they could. I recall another story I heard some years ago at a retirement dinner for my home pastor. He painfully recalled how he'd been blackballed from the local Kiwanis Club when he first tried to join in the mid to late 60s. My father later filled me in telling me that it was because he was known to be a supportive of school integration and equal rights for all races, which was not popular sentiment at the time in our small Florida town. He was finally admitted to membership in that club some years later, and he extolled the philanthropic projects that he'd been involved in. And yet the sting of that earlier rejection was still evident in his voice as he shared that story. Whenever we experience rejection, it might be helpful to remember that Jesus knows what it feels like, for he experienced it too, most extremely on the cross, but earlier too. For the people in his hometown had, had put Jesus in a box. They, they knew his family and his background. Who does he think he is trying to teach us in the synagogue? Isn't he just a carpenter, a manual laborer? And by stating that he was the son of Mary, they actually were questioning the legitimacy of his birth. For otherwise, they would have said he's the son of Joseph. These people who had watched him grow up rejected his being anything other than what they thought he should be. He should stay in his lane and stick to carpentry. 
Well, Mark highlights for us some consequences of Jesus being rejected by his hometown crowd. And really, that's what I'd like for us to focus on this morning. He could do no deeds of power there except for curing a few sick people. The negative energy of the rejection and unbelief limited Jesus' power. Those who knew him best could imagine how God's life-enhancing, resurrecting, healing power could be at work in him and through him. Today, we as the church are probably the ones most familiar with Jesus. So we must take care not to limit Jesus' power. Our rejection of, of other people, or even of new ideas or, or ways of thinking, just might limit God's transforming healing power to be at work in our lives. And what is faith, if not an open door to endless possibilities? It's an extraordinary power, but it can be limited by that negative energy of rejection. For he was amazed at their unbelief. And there's a lot of rejection going on in our world these days. People face rejection from their political views to their taste in clothes, from their sexual identity to the color of their skin. And social media has compounded the negative energy that comes from rejection. War is probably the most extreme example of one group of people rejecting and demonizing another. All forms of rejection limit God's life-enhancing, healing, and creative powers of love. Did you notice that Jesus didn't stick around in his hometown for long? Instead, he headed out to teach in the neighboring villages. And then he sends out his disciples in pairs to bring healing and transformation in more people's lives. He instructs them not to take any money or food, I think he wants them to, to learn how to trust God's sustaining them through the hospitality of others. He also readies them for how to handle rejection. Don't let that negative energy cling to you. Shake the dust off your feet. Their rejection is not about you. It's about them. It's not easy to shake the dust off our feet when we get rejected. We're more apt to, to get defensive or go on the offensive with some kind of revengeful payback. Or we might even respond inwardly with harmful responses, like finding ways to numb our pain or get caught in the trap of self-loathing brain chatter. But such responses keep that neg negative energy alive and even growing. They inhibit the openness needed for healing and transformation to happen. We're all probably aware of that negative energy created when we get rejected. But how aware are we of the negative energy created when we are the ones rejecting someone or something? Now, rejecting is just a part of our natural early development when our two-year-old self learns how to say no. And we learn how to order things in our lives with yes and no. This is good and desirable. This is bad and should be rejected. And yet this dualistic way of thinking can stall our growth in faith. A non-dualistic approach to the world makes it much easier to shake the dust off our feet and move on. For a non-dualistic way of thinking and seeing is more accepting and less apt to reject anyone or anything. It accepts reality just as it is, even if it's violent and tragic. This non-dualistic -dual way, way of accepting is more open and expansive and thus conducive for healing and transformation to happen. And this is the message that Jesus embodied and proclaimed. The kingdom of God has come near. God, it's open reign of love for all. So be open 
to change. Repent and believe in this good news. And this message of repentance, his disciples also proclaimed as they went out in pairs on their healing mission. I think we can sometimes get tripped up on that word repent, but it, it just means being open to being changed. Literally, the Greek word metanoia can be translated a change of mind, a new way of thinking. So to repent means to be open-minded, open to transformation, open to accepting rather than rejecting. Our repentance is a turning around of our lives in such ways that we're incorporated into God's ongoing love for all of creation. Whenever we find ourselves upset and perturbed by someone or something and tempted to dismiss or reject, perhaps, perhaps we might get curious instead and inquire within about what's happening. Is fear somehow involved? Does it rub up against our culture or upbringing? Will it force us to unlearn something that we thought to be true? Are we afraid it will spiral us into a pit of meaninglessness or doubt? In what ways do our rejections inhibit our growth and transformation? In what ways might they inhibit God's presence and power to be at work within us? When Richard Nixon attended Hubert Humphrey's funeral, he experienced the cold shoulders of rejection for having dragged himself and the country through the humiliation of Watergate. As eyes turned away and conversations ran dry around him, Nixon could feel the ostracism being ladled out to him. And then Jimmy Carter, the serving U.S. president, walked into the room. Now Carter was from a different political party to Nixon, and well known for his honesty and integrity. And as he moved to his seat, President Carter noticed Richard Nixon standing all alone. What well, Carter immediately changed course, walked over to Richard Nixon, held out his hand, smiling genuinely and broadly, embraced Nixon and said, welcome home, Mr. President, welcome home. This incident was reported by Newsweek magazine, which noted, if there was a turning point in Nixon's long ordeal in the wilderness, it was that moment and that gesture of love and compassion. Rejection is a closing in and contracting of God's creative transformative power. Whereas welcoming opens us up and unleashes God's power for restoration, healing, and wholeness of life. I think it was very intentional of Mark to, to put these two events next to one another. Jesus' rejection in his hometown, which constrained his ministry of healing, which was subsequently expanded as he commissions his disciples with authority to go out and heal as they go forth into neighboring towns. Today, we receive not only Christ's presence through bread and wine, but also that same authority that Christ gave to the disciples to go forth to be God's welcoming, healing presence in the world. I wonder where we will find ourselves participating this week in God's sacred work of reconciling the world. Amen. Amen.